writer, curator, and textile historian Catherine E. McKinley has gathered hundreds of rare and original photographic images of African women spanning the last 150 years. Many of the images are included in Catherine's new book, The African Lookbook, a visual history of 100 years of African women. The images present a visual history of the power and grace of African women and focus on fashion as a form of protest and resistance. For this special Black History Month presentation, Catherine is joined in conversation by acclaimed photographer and St. Louis native Dario Kamis. Artist, writer, and director Dario Kamis made history in 2020 as the first black photographer to shoot the cover of Vanity Fair magazine in its 106-year history with his portrait of Oscar-winning actor Viola Davis. His photography has been shown in museums and fine art galleries nationally and internationally, and he's previously worked with everyone from the New York Times to Beyonce. Dario is also the host of the popular design podcast, Institute of Black Imagination. Catherine, it's so great to chat with you um, about this amazing book that you've created, which is the African Lookbook, um, which I, I, I find so fascinating and, and we'll get more into it. Um, but, you know, I, I think I mentioned to you earlier that I was a, a fan of your work, um, particularly your book on the history of indigo um, and indigo dye. And so when they asked me uh, to be a part of this. And I saw the name, I was like, oh, that sounds so familiar. And I like literally had like just quoted you like the month before. So, so it's a pleasure to, to have a conversation with you. It's nice to be with you. I've been following you for a long time. Oh, oh. Your, your most recent work. So. Oh, oh, thank you. How are you feeling today, by the way? I feel good. I feel good. So tell me a little bit about the African lookbook. Um, I know that you were collect, I mean, you've had several trips that you've taken to, to the continent of Africa um, and you have a background in, in photography from an academic standpoint, but like, how did this book come about? Um, the book, I started traveling to Africa in 1991 and initially I was going just for fun and to explore and, you know, do kind of some degree of research about the past and about some family connections to Ghana in particular. And you would meet new friends and they would give you these tiny photos as a parting gift. And they were beautiful photos because photography for most people was expensive. And so it was kind of an event to have a photo taken. So people would really dress and, you know, they'd have these gorgeous photographs. And I started, I kept those. They felt very intimate and a lot like those kind of Victorian calling cards. There's mm -hmm, still a mm -hmm. culture of, um, of pen pal relationships and that sort of thing. So they were very special. And then I started to do fashion research within five years of that. And I was looking at the earliest indigo fashions in particular or indigo textiles. And for the most part, I had to rely on the colonial record of what was put down in sketchbooks and that sort of thing. And it was very, very unreliable and frustrating because the colors were never right and people's faces were Europeanized and it just it made me nuts. So I said, okay, where is, where's the photographic record begin? And I realized it began in the, around 1850, 1856. And so I started to search for the earliest photographs. So that's really where my photo collecting began seriously trying to develop that record of um, textile history. And then around, this, around the late 1990s, Sedu Keita and Malik Sidibe hit the European and American art market. And all of a sudden it was like the, the cover was off and here was this new photography and I became more and more interested in it. And there was a lot of interest in fashion because the Keita photographs in particular have these you know, women in this gorgeous clothing and there was some talk about the meanings of the fashions. And I just started to get more interested in what, what is not only the meaning of the fashion, but what's the history behind it? Because here are all these women in 
quote unquote African dress, but all of the materials were European or Indian or Asian. So it just, um, it kind of started to have a life of its own from there. Like in looking at the book, when when talking about the individual photographs, Mm -hmm. I mean, you're so specific Mm -hmm. about like the textile and where the textile came from and like the style of the sleeve and the style of the collar and the jewelry, like, and, and not even like, this is the style of the dress, like a bobo, right? But like literally the country where these fabrics came from and also like the styles that were being imitated or like replicated. How did you research that like from a photograph? Like, how did you like, imagine, okay, you see a woman in like a lace bobo, like how did you find that fabric and like where it came from? I spent a lot of time, um, I lived on and off in Ghana in particular, but I've really been traveling since the nineties, I've been traveling yearly. So I have, and I've been in 14 countries in West and Southern Africa. So I have quite a relationship now over time, but I spent a lot of time in the marketplace and in, you know, kind of running up on the aunties and trying to get all the information about what they're wearing and, you know, sitting in people's bedrooms when they're getting dressed <laughs> and that sort of thing. But it, it really just became this fascination because it's so much about, it's so intimate, fashion is so intimate and particularly mm-hmm. for African women and men, cloth is considered, you know, like the next layer of skin between the spirit and the outer world. So cloth has, it has so much meaning spiritually, socially, you know, from country to country and from group to group. And even within one nation, there's so many iterations of things. One, one group doesn't like this material. The other one values Mm. it quite a bit. One color means something and means something different to a neighbor. So it's just, it's kind of endless and it's really a fascinating thing to go into. Could you talk to us a little bit about your background? Like, who are, like, who are you? Like, uh-huh. where did you come from? Like, uh-huh. <laughs> how did this interest in fashion, you know, you know enter uh, your sphere of interest? I just grew up always hearing stories about nothing like a, a tree wasn't a tree, a tree had all this. <laughs> so, so I ingrained a lot of that. But I grew up in a clothing factory town in Massachusetts, Attleboro, Massachusetts. It's close to Providence, Rhode Island. And so I really grew up in that like clothing mill culture or really the end of the clothing mill culture because um, the area was quite depressed and a lot of the clothing mills had, had closed. But um, I had an awareness of those factories and this kind of shadow history and a lot of people that didn't um, continue in the mills went on to sell secondhand clothing and so when I was traveling to Africa I had an awareness of how the secondhand clothing market was was growing and really doing damage to people on the continent but you know Massachusetts is very it's a very waspy state and I grew up in a very waspy community and I just felt like the drabness of there was something about that L.L. Bean drabness It just felt, it felt utterly suffocating to me as a child. I was very, very aware of that. I just, I didn't want to see another plaid. And I think it really started for me. We went to Scotland on a trip when I was 11 or 12 years old. And I remember being in a pub and there were two African couples sitting there at the table. And this was the seventies and they were wearing bell bottoms and they were wearing Harris tweed, but it was funky. And it was, you know, everything was, it was just on another level from what I'd seen. And I, one woman had on a dress in a wax print and she had a sweater on inside. And I just remember sitting there and saying, that's a different way to wear a sweater. Your, <laughs> your dress is more important than your, your turtleneck. You know? And I just remember that was when the light went off and I said, okay, there's something about this that, that has meaning. So that's like, that's really funny. fascinating. I find I find that story like super fascinating because in it are all of the ingredients of like this book. Yeah. And like who you became. You know, looking at your book and, and, and reading through it, so much of that is embedded in all of this. You know, one of the biggest surprises or like welcome surprises was really seeing how 
incredibly articulated mm -hmm. and fashion forward. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these subjects are in, in, in the photographs. And, you know, we spoke earlier just about just how fashion or our clothing, you know, allows for someone to become, right? Like it's like almost the first point of entry in a in presentation, right? And how you are literally going to live in the world, like cloth. Even when I think about, um, you know, even like our trans brothers and sisters, like it's usually garment that indicates how they want to be represented in the world before yeah. anything else changes. Mm -hmm. um, and so really, you know, going through the book and seeing how like just, and, 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 and thank you for like that scholarship, right? Because, you know, uh, yes, I've seen Malik Sidibe's work. I've seen Seydou Kaita's work. Um, and, you know, I've always admired the photographs, but, you know, when you're able to name a thing, when you're able to locate, it's again, kind of like the, 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 the tree isn't just a tree. Right. Like you, you do that work in these photographs where you really add the level of substance um, and richness and and the wealth and and also the histories of of class right and class presentation that are all encoded in a dress yeah right so I think that's you know in, in, incredible um, so I mean I don't know do you have a question for me before we like go in I don't know yeah my question what's your relationship to African photography What's my relationship to African photography? I was doing a series of portraits uh, of a woman in Harlem named Lana Turner. Mm -hmm. And um, I was in grad school. I bought a film camera for the first time mm -hmm. and I wanted to play with it. It's a, it's a twin lens mm -hmm. reflex Mamiya. Mm -hmm. um, and actually I can show you, hold on, since we're in my studio, hold on one second. That is the camera. Very nice. So this is my, this is my first film camera. And so um, when I got it, it was, I was totally kind of like you drawn by the aesthetics of it, right? So I was like, this makes me think of old time portraiture. So I just started grabbing friends and throwing up a backdrop in the middle of Harlem, right? Like on, on the street next to my apartment. And um, just started taking these, what I called family portraits. Okay. And I did the same with this woman, Lana Turner. That ended up being an exhibition actually in St. Louis. But when I was in grad school, I brought the photos into class and my teacher was like, have you heard of Malik Sidibe? Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, I haven't. And then she starts showing me all of these images that felt very much like the photographs that I'd been taking. And for me, first to answer your question, that was my first introduction to African photography, but it also began what I, what I, what I come to, what I came to understand was like ancestral memory mm -hmm. and how we as creatives are, as, as people in general are, are carrying histories with us that we aren't always conscious of. Mm -hmm. um, and I found that to be extremely fascinating. And then something that I even personally encountered um, going to the continent of Africa myself, just like the resonances and the things that, that somehow even after 400 years, were still very much present, like still very much a part of our, our lives and vernacular. You begin the book speaking about um, sewing mm -hmm. um, and how dressmaking, at least, I mean, even in the African-American tradition was a huge part of, of our culture um, and our towns. And, and my mother uh, herself was a seamstress, you oh. know, growing up. So the, the love of cloth, textile, texture, detail, all of these things that show up in my work Mm -hmm. are directly tied to this dressmaking tradition in the African-American community. And even um, a few years ago, I worked on an exhibition at FIT around Black mm -hmm. designers and many Black fashion designers, their first entry point is a mother or more than likely a grandmother that yeah. had sewing as a part of their, of, of their livelihood. Um, and, you know, even tying it back to St. Louis, um, you know, Elizabeth Keckley, who was the dressmaker for Mary Todd Lincoln, 
um, that many people don't, you know, don't know. And she actually struck up a friendship with her, actually wrote a book um, mm-hmm. about her friendship with Mary Todd Lincoln, but it was the sewing machine. Mm-hmm. It was the agency that the sewing machine and cloth allowed for her, literally allowed her to buy herself out of freedom because she was a slave in St. Louis, bought her own freedom and was able to move to Washington, D.C. So could you talk a bit about the ways in which the sewing machine, because I love how you really kind of fuse these technologies that I don't think have really been in direct and explicit conversation before, um, mm-hmm. but the sewing machine and the camera and how they both kind of arrived around the same time. Yeah. And then also how they allowed for a sense of agency for women on the continent, if you could speak a bit about that. <clears throat> yeah, well, there were versions of both the camera and the sewing machine long before they were kind of declared what they are. But um, in the late eight, mid to late 1800s, the sewing machine was like an established machinery and the camera 1839, so within roughly 20 years of each other. And they both came to the continent of Africa around the same time within, give or take 10 years of each other. And the camera arrived initially as um, as an instrument for the colonial powers to execute control and, you know, to be able to really to be able to communicate what was going on in terms of building and subjugation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to other points in the colonial empire. You know, it was a kind of carefully orchestrated, like let's share this information to keep morale going and also to begin to catalog human beings and make- I mean, it was propaganda. Like it was complete propaganda. Like it was completely used to, to, to categorize and, and I'm just going to say castify, which is like not a word, you know, these, you know, um, these colonial, colonial subjects, right? I mean, by 1869, there was a direct order from the British offices saying that you should document and subjugate with the camera. So it was, I mean, it was, it was policy really. Um, And the sewing machine initially was for the most elite. So it was for colonial officers. It was used to make uniforms to, you know, kind of outfit the Republic. And, but, and it was the only Africans that owned sewing machines for a good number of years were Kings and other elites. And so you would see them put in grave sites and, you know, used as these kind of honorific tools, but they didn't really make their way into the general public until closer to like 1880 and then slowly became like a kind of democratic tool. And so for most women, a sewing machine was part of their dowry. And it was a really important economic tool because not only would you take care of your household and outfit your household, but you could possibly rent that sewing machine out to someone else and make income from it. So that, and that's really where it, it became a tool of agency. You know, that's really interesting because um, that's still kind of a practice (laughs) today. My mother, the reason she began sewing was when she married my father. Do do you you personally have a history of sewing? Um, Not so much. I was in a sewing circle for a while with other writers. We had this little writer's sewing circle going on for a while. But I do, like, almost everything I wear is made by a tailor. And I really love that culture, you know, when when you're living in Africa, you're kind of like, okay, there's an event. So you buy your cloth and you have the thing sewn. <laughs> and I love, I love the exchange of that culture. And a lot of times um, I write about this quite a bit in the book, but when you go out with friends or if you go to a funeral or if you're part of like a women's savings group or whatever it is, there are moments where everyone wears the same cloth. It's called making an anchor. So someone important to whatever it is. If it's a funeral, it may be like the intimate family members will go and they'll either design or buy one cloth. And then they let everybody in the market know that if you're coming to buy for this funeral, this is the, this is the cloth. Mm. That everybody that's near and dear and wants to show their very close um, sympathy or joy or whatever it is, they'll buy that cloth and then they'll sew it in their own style. So, that was a that was a special thing to be part of to to 
to go out and make an anchor with other people and feel like you're you're part of that thing. And then as I got to understand it better, I realized, you know, I think I was at a funeral the first time I really understood it. I heard a woman say, tie your cloth to my cloth and let's forget they were all, all the women at the funeral were grieving this person that had died. And, and they said, forget, forget, tie your cloth to my cloth, which is literally like tie your spirit to my spirit and let's forget. That idea again of the, the spirit living in the cloth. But it is this way in which cloth um, unifies. And it's interesting, again, because of this kind of ancestral DNA memory. And so you're still acting out things that you may not know the origins of. But And, and I think it also really speaks to just the state of being um, an African-American um, or, or being of African descent in the States where you are really removed from your traditions, but you're still behaving in ways that, but, but if you don't know where it comes from, you yeah. just feel kind of lost. Do you know what I mean? You don't really realize how much of yourself and your even just your behaviors and actions are really tied to something. They really do come from a place. And I think we historically have just been stripped of all of those you know, traditions and, you know, even as you speak about like making an anchor, um, you were speaking a little bit about um, money, right? And the ways in which um, the sewing machine served as a, a means of capital gain for, for women and empowering them. But could you speak about the ways in which cloth itself was used as currency? Oh yeah, cloth, I mean- Because I found that very fascinating. Yeah, it is fascinating. Cloth stood in for current, cloth was currency for a millennium. <laughs> and during the transatlantic slave trade, cloth was, it represented really pretty evenly across those hundreds of years. Um, it stood in for money as currency in the transatlantic slave trade. So for instance, two yards of indigo cloth could be exchanged for one human being. When you go and you look through the the log books of the shippers and the slavers, et cetera. It was very, very powerful. People talked about color and cloth being more powerful than the gun. They mm. weren't necessarily sending munitions. They were sending these kind of like sumptuary goods that there was such a demand for. People were so in love and, you know, kind of up to the minute and wanted the latest and loved cloth, not just African textiles, but cloth from all over. What I, what I, you know, in looking at the book, I think it's so important because it rewrites so much of what we think yeah. of, you know, Africa, the African continent, um, you know, even you spoke about like, you know, tradition. And I think it's important that we as a culture understand who's telling the story, mm -hmm. right? Like who is, who is telling you the story about what Africa is yeah or was? Is it Africans? Is it people who look like them? Or, or, or is yeah. it like a colonial romance mm -hmm. of, 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 of a people who are untouched? And, you know, and, and then also like, which feeds into, you know, narratives around primitivism and, you know, all of these things, because to, to make them up to date would completely ruin yeah. like the colonial narrative and desire for them to remain and stay, you know, quote unquote, savages. Um, That's what which... in the photos, because the, the photos don't lie. It's right there. Yeah. And I said, okay, rather than me, even as a non-continental African, you know, I was like, okay, we, we'll read the, this is the document. The photos don't lie. You start to take apart, you know, what, what is she wearing? What is that shoe mm -hmm. that the man wears? And it just reveals so much. And then also, I think what was really interesting in the book, and I want to ask you about um, why you chose women mm -hmm. and African women specifically as a focal point. A lot of the portraiture is female. And a lot of when you see portraiture of men or when you see images of men, it's more labor related. You know, it's like the push cart person, the steward, it's all these other kinds of things. But there are these kind of types within representations of women that are, they were fascinating to me. And then also, you know, just the 
the idea of skin and the politics of skin and the body are much more, um, I don't know, they're, they're just, it's much more present and much more fraught in portrayals of women. Uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't even really think about it, um, but like growing up and you're seeing these women um, and particularly, you know, tribal women who are, who are naked and, you know, you see, you know, they're normal tribal accoutrements, right? You know, beads and necklaces and all of these things, but not really understanding what you speak to very clearly in the book, that this was about the colonial gaze. This is almost like colonial porn. Yeah. So that, you know, these men could ogle women's bodies without it being like their women, right? Like, like our women get to stay pure and holy and saintly, uh, but we're going to put our gaze on these other women. Um, but what I also find interesting in the ways in which you infuse these two technologies is, pardon me, how they have de how they democratize mm -hmm. formally elite um, and 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 es and esoteric forms, right? So how the camera democratize uh, representation, right? Before it was painting. Mm -hmm. And only families who could afford, right, to have their portraits taken and, you know, all of these things were able to have, you know, these paintings and in the paintings would be all of the trappings of their wealth, right, all of the things that they wanted to signal to. Mm -hmm. um, but then the photograph or the, the camera, you know, over time really democratized that now to the point where we're able to like do it on our phones, right. Yeah. Um, but then the sewing machine did the same. Mm -hmm. because, you know, access to certain fabrics, um, colors, right? I mean, there were cultures where like it was illegal to wear red if you were poor. Mm -hmm. So how the sewing machine also was a tool of democratization mm -hmm. of, of, of really self-expression yeah. and how both of them became tools of that. Um, so I found that that was really interesting. Were you thinking about that at all and in, 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 in how you, you know, juxtapose these two technologies? I don't, it's funny, the technologies, it came out at a dinner, I was at a dinner with all these wealthy collectors of, a lot of them collectors of African photography, and we were all sitting around the table, and I don't know, I think it came out of my frustration with the company, in a way, but we were talking- What, which company? About, oh, these, you mean like the people wealthy, you were with? Yeah, these wealthy, mostly white male collectors of African photography. And I don't know, I just like, all of a sudden I put those ideas together. We were talking about an exhibition, the possibilities of an exhibition, and they kind of laughed it off. And they, you know, they were saying, huh, like the, the car, the automobile and the this and that, and all this kind of big technology, the water pump and da 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 da, da has to be more important than that. And I was thinking, no, not for women because the automobile was not accessible to most African women. The, you know, all these different tools of empire and what came later during independence were not accessible across class groups. And then even when they were, they were frequently, they frequently failed. So what were like the steadfast things, the things that people continuously had access to and had, and were able to make something of. Mm -hmm. And it was those, those two items. And so I was just sitting with these men like, no, <laughs> you know, like women win again. You know? <laughs> it's, yeah. And, it's and so also accurate. like the sheer portability of them too. Like, exactly. you know, the, the ability to, to move and to take this thing with you and, you know, you know, this machine combined with the skill. I mean, even as a photographer, I realized very quickly, even as a hobby, that uh, being a photographer was something either the person I was talking to needed or they knew someone who needed one. Like you were always in demand in some kind of way. Like everybody wanted to have something documented. And so yeah. how this one instrument mm -hmm. gave me access to so many things. Like an African photographer who doesn't have access to travel or someone that didn't have access to schooling, all of a sudden have the tools to catapult themselves way beyond the life that they might've had. Not everybody, not everybody's a Dario, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, it, it's, it's just an incredible tool and it's an incredible way to 
kind of fight back to look at these images of African women who we don't, we are trying to figure out when the first female African photographer was, was practicing. I can't nail it down. There was no critical number really until like the late nineties, maybe into the two thousands. That's pretty stunning. But so if you think about the subjects of these photos even never had the privilege of like there was always even just the gender um, dynamics between the sitter and the subject, even though Africans were practicing as photographers as early as like the late 1800s. So they've, they've always been there. They were competitive with the European photographers. But, um, you know, for women, it was, there was always still a kind of negotiation of power. Thank you, Catherine. If anybody wants to purchase the book, it's available at Novel Neighbor. Uh, it looks just like that. The thank you to the St. Louis County Library. And thank you again, Catherine, for this wonderful conversation. Thank you.